Did you know that birth control pills actually cause early silent abortions? Most people think that birth control pills simply prevent a woman from getting pregnant, which is sometimes the case. However, birth control pills also act as an abortifacient, snuffing out a young life that has already begun. Not only that, but the Bible actually condemns other birth control methods as well. In our modern society, birth control is something that most people take for granted and have never even questioned. But we as Christians are commanded by the Bible to prove all things. And in the course of this film, you will learn the shocking truth about birth control. Currently in the United States, the pill is used by over 11 million women, many of whom are unaware of its mechanisms of action, even though they are printed on the packaging. Our message today is that the pill kills babies with its abortifacient effects. Birth control pills cause silent abortions. If you are taking birth control pills, you are inadvertently, literally killing your children. And remember, this is the most commonly used birth control method. So before we get into the subject from the Bible of whether birth control is right or wrong, let me just start out by saying that the most commonly used, the most popular method of birth control, the one that four out of five women have used, is a pill that will literally cause your unborn children to die. Let me start out by proving to you from the Bible that life begins at conception. Look down at your Bible at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now flip over if you would to Matthew chapter 1, because in Matthew chapter 1, this exact scripture is quoted in the New Testament. In the Old Testament it said, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Well, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the Bible reads, Behold! A virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth the son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So isn't it interesting that in the Old Testament it says conceive, and in the New Testament it says shall be with child. You know what that tells me? That conception produces a child. Not a blastocyst or an embryo or a fetus, but God considers that a child. When we talk about life beginning at conception, the devil loves to change the meaning of words. Now, conception has historically always meant fertilization. When the seed from the man and the egg from the woman come together and that egg is fertilized, that has been known as conception. But now they're starting to change the definition. And even in some dictionaries, they'll put a definition that says, well, it's fertilization or implantation. Dr. Vanessa Cullins, Vice President for Medical Affairs at Planned Parenthood Federation of America, was asked if hormonal birth control pills cause abortion. Her response was, no. Abortion ends a pregnancy. Contraception pills work before a pregnancy begins. Pregnancy begins with the implantation of the developing fertilized egg in a woman's uterus. Yet, in the next paragraph, she admits, implantation doesn't occur until five to seven days at the fertilization. Let's see what the Bible defines as conception. Let's make the Bible our final authority. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 11, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged them faithful who had promised. So let me ask you this. Could conceive seed refer to implantation? Let me explain to you the terms here. The seed from the man travels into the woman's body and finds the egg and the egg is fertilized up toward the top of the fallopian tubes. That fertilized egg, that developing child that's multiplying and growing and so forth, begins to travel down that tube until it gets to the uterus. And when it arrives at the uterus, it implants itself into the wall of the uterus and then eventually that's where the placenta is going to be attached and then there's going to be a cord and the baby and so on and so forth. But that developing life comes down that tube and implants in the wall of the uterus. Now, when the Bible says that she's received strength to conceive seed, 
Notice that conception is tied in with the seed, isn't it? Is the seed involved with implantation? No, because the seed is long gone. The seed from the man fertilizes that egg and then all the seed is gone. Okay, and then a week goes by and then it implants. How could you call implantation conceiving seed? You can't, there's no seed there anymore. The seed has been gone for over a week. So we see that the world's definition, that's a new definition that they're twisting and changing things to mean and that Planned Parenthood has pushed is not in tune with the Bible. It's just a lie of the devil to try to get you to say, oh yeah, life begins at conception. That's seven to 14 days after fertilization. So here's how these birth control pills work. The combination pill works according to two mechanisms. There's a primary mechanism and then there's a backup mechanism, okay? The primary mechanism is to stop a woman from ovulating. She does not release an egg, therefore no pregnancy can occur. Now, if a woman just doesn't release an egg and no pregnancy occurs, is any human life being snuffed out? Is anyone being killed? No. It's just no egg is produced, and so there's not a pregnancy. But there's the backup mechanism. The pill thins the uterine lining and depletes it of essential nutrients such as glycodilin A to the degree that it cannot nourish a newly conceived baby. IVF data has repeatedly shown that the minimal endometrial thickness, which is required to maintain an early pregnancy ranges from 5 to 13 millimeters. The average endometrial thickness of a pill user is only 1.4 millimeters. This is simply too thin to nourish a baby. Consequently, the baby dies, and this is an abortion. You say, well, how often is this happening? Well, it depends on what type of pill is being taken. The most common pill, the popular pill, is the combination pill, which is estrogen and progestin combination. Breakthrough ovulation, which is when an egg is released, even though you're taking the birth control pill, occurs five to 60% of the time. Simple logic tells us that if an egg can be released and fertilized five to 60% of the time, and implantation is being prevented close to 100% of the time, a silent abortion is taking place. Five to 60% of months a woman is taking the pill because the seven day old child is unable to implant and dies. The morning after pill functions after the same principle to destroy the lining of the uterus, but in a shorter period of time due to higher concentrations of the same hormones. Women deserve to be told the truth about the abortifacient mechanisms of the pill. To de-emphasize this information is unconscionable. Same thing with the Depo-Provera patch, the Depo-Provera shots. Any hormonal birth control method is an abortifacient that is causing you to have a silent abortion some percentage of the time. And we as Christians should just reject it outright as being manslaughter or murder to take these type of pills, knowing what they're doing to your body and knowing what they're doing to your children. The term birth control pills is accurate since they do not prevent conception, but birth. Perhaps the reason God has not ended the abortion holocaust in America is that God's own people are unknowingly murdering their own offspring. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? And not only that, I'm doing you a great favor by uh, warning you about these things because honestly, birth control pills are very harmful to your health in the first place. You know, the pill kills. And I'm gonna tell you during this talk how that happens. So there are four major mechanisms how the pill can kill. They cause your blood to clot. They cause cancer. They make it easier to get potentially lethal infections, and they make it more likely you'll die a violent death. So what about this blood clotting? Well, 
If the blood clots in an artery of your heart, it's a heart attack or an MI. If it clots in your brain, that's called a stroke. If it causes clots in the veins in your legs, that's called a DVT or deep venous thrombosis. And if those clots in your legs break off and go to your lung, that's called a pulmonary embolism. In 2005, the International Agency on Research of Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization, a UN body, put out monograph 91 that stated estrogen progestin combination drugs in hormone replacement therapy and birth control pills were group one carcinogens for breast, cervical, and liver cancer. And yet that didn't make it on the six o'clock news. 2006, Chris Callenborn published a meta-analysis on the pill in the Mayo Clinic uh, Proceedings Journal. In 2009, Dahl uh, and other authors put out this paper that showed that you had a 320% increased risk of triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancer is the hardest breast cancer to treat because it's not sensitive to hormonal treatment, it's not sensitive to that monoclonal antibody drug Herceptin, and there are a lot of deaths from it in premenopausal women, especially. So if you took the pill 18 and under, and that's very common, I have patients that come in, they're 22, and they've already been on the pill for 10 years because they got put on it when they were 12 and they had painful periods. So since 1975, by the governmental SEER data that you can also look up on the web, the incidence of in situ breast cancers, non-invasive breast cancers, has gone up 400% in premenopausal women. So you also increase the risk of cervical cancer, and you also increase the risk of liver cancer. If you look at the history of birth control in this country, first of all, historically, it's been considered ungodly and immoral to use birth control by Christian people throughout history. In fact, it was illegal in the United States until the 20th century. Before 1936, all contraceptive devices and birth control methods were illegal in the United States of America. In 1938, Judge August Hand lifted the federal ban on birth control. In 1965, the United States Supreme Court overturned one of the last state laws prohibiting the prescription or use of contraceptives by married couples. What the world and the civil government consider immoral and even criminal, fundamental Christianity embraces less than 70 years later. Preachers used to be against birth control. You know, one of the most famous Baptist preachers of all time's name is John R. Rice. And whether you love John R. Rice or you're not a fan of John R. Rice isn't really the point. He was a mainstream, very popular, independent Baptist preacher. John R. Rice said this in 1946. Birth control measures, if generally practiced, would be disastrous to public morals and public welfare. Here's what else he said. The use of artificial means, drugs, and appliances to prevent conception has for centuries been regarded as immoral, wrong for the individual, and dangerous to society as a whole. Yet people today will act like, oh, you know, what are you preaching? You're, you know, you're an independent Baptist and you're preaching against birth control? You're wild, you're crazy, you're fanatic. But this is what everyone used to believe. In the words of our 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt, Birth control is sinful. Could a Baptist preacher today say in his pulpit what the President of the United States said in a public speech only 100 years ago? The woman who is responsible for bringing birth control into the mainstream and making it legal in the United States was a woman named Margaret Sanger. Now this Margaret Sanger was a eugenicist. So where did this campaign for birth control as a means of better health and empowering the family for the black community originate? We have to understand something called eugenics. 
which was basically uh, people thought that the unfit should not reproduce uh, and the fit should. So from this background of eugenics, someone named Margaret Sanger, and if you're not familiar with her, she's the founder of Planned Parenthood. Some, the Margaret Sanger was a proponent of eugenics, and she believed that the racially unfit should not reproduce. And during her time in the early 1900s, who would be the racially unfit? Well, they'd be African Americans. She believed that white people were superior to other races. And she, like the Nazis, you know, believed that certain races were inferior to others and that we need to uh, encourage those people not to reproduce so that we can just have the good people reproduce and the, the fittest and the strongest people reproduce. So in comes Margaret Sanger with her slick talk. But in reality, Margaret Sanger thought of these people as human waste which really should, they should not be reproducing anymore because they're just like weeds. And so she came in with her talk of family planning and better health to try to basically trick the community into buying her program, which is really sterilization, birth control, and abortion. She started an organization called the Birth Control Federation of America. And do you know what the Birth Control Federation of America later changed its name to? Planned Parenthood which I call Planned Parenthood, okay? Planned Parenthood, that wicked organization that conservatives rail against for being pro-abortion and pro-death was actually originally known as the Birth Control Federation of America. So you can see the type of evil people that are behind this agenda. She's the one who pushed this through and got it legal in the United States. She's the one that promoted it and made it mainstream. This wicked, evil person named Margaret Sanger, who is an evolutionist and who was uh, not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ by any stretch of the imagination. This is Margaret Slee, president of America's Planned Parenthood Federation, maintains that European women should stop having babies for the next 10 years. Don't you think such a theory, such a radical theory, is antisocial? On the contrary, it seems to me that it is more practical and humane. But from my view, I believe that there should be no more babies. Do you believe in sin? When I say believe, I don't mean in believe in committing sin. Do you believe there is such a thing as, a, as sin? Well, I think the greatest sin in the world is bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents that have no chance in the world to be a human being, practically. Delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mark when they're born. That, to me, is the greatest sin that people can, can commit. Anyway, the bottom line is that, biblically speaking, God wants us to have children. And he wants us to be fruitful and multiply. Let's look at some scriptures on this. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And you say, well, Pastor Anderson, God's just telling them to be fruitful and multiply because there's only two of them. Obviously, when there are only two people, you're gonna have to be fruitful and multiply. But what you have to understand is that he used the word replenish for a reason. Now, if he were just talking to Adam and Eve only, the word replenish would make absolutely no sense. Because replenish means to refill. Well, guess what? It had never been filled before. So how can he tell them refill or replenish? The reason he tells them to replenish is because of the fact that it is not a command just to Adam and Eve, but rather a command to all of mankind to continually replenish the earth. Children are going to be born and people are going to die. And it's our job to be fruitful, to multiply and to replenish the earth on an ongoing basis. And the word replenish proves that he was not speaking to just Adam only in that scripture. But even so, we have tons of other scripture. Look at Genesis chapter nine, what God said to Noah. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And you be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. Say, Pastor Anderson, there's only eight of them. Of course they need to replenish. I'm gonna show you that this is a theme that comes up over and over again. This wasn't just Adam, this wasn't just Noah. 
Over and over again, God's people are told to be fruitful and multiply. It says in chapter 17, verse 20, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. And by the way, notice that being fruitful and multiplying is always associated with blessing, being blessed. When you're fruitful, when you multiply, that's a blessing in the Bible. Genesis 28, verse 3. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. This is when the children of Israel are already numbering in the millions. There are millions and millions of children of Israel and they're out of Egypt and they're going into the promised land. And God says, if you obey my voice and if you keep my commandments, I will make you fruitful and I will multiply you. God wants his people to be fruitful and to multiply and it's a blessing when they do. Now in Exodus chapter one, we have a story about the children of Israel. They've gone down into Egypt and when they went down into Egypt, the Bible tells us in verse five, And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. So the children of Israel that go down into Egypt are 70 souls, 70 people. And they're going down to Egypt, which is one of the most powerful nations in the world. A great, big, giant, powerful nation. They are 70 people. Let's fast forward a few hundred years and look what the Bible says in verse seven. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Let me ask this, are God's people multiplying? And look what the Bible says in verse eight. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So are the Egyptians multiplying at the same rate as the Israelites? No, the Egyptians are obviously not multiplying. And by the way, if you go to Planned Parenthood's website, they'll tell you birth control was invented in ancient Egypt. That's what Planned Parenthood says on their website. The oldest known birth control we found was found in ancient Egypt. And the Bible here shows us a contrast of God's people being fruitful, multiplying and increasing abundantly while the population of the worldly Egyptians is not keeping pace at all to the point where 70 people outpace them. And they say the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Now look, Pharaoh here, this evil king that wants to kill children later in the chapter represents the devil. And so what we see in this story is that number one, God's people multiplied greatly. Number two, we see the devil didn't like it. The devil is upset about it. So what's the devil gonna do about it to stop it? Let's read it. It says in verse 10, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. They said, look, we need to do something about this. We need to stop these people from multiplying. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And it made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in motor, and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. And what do we see here in all these verses over and over again? They're making them do what? Work and serve with rigor and have burdens and have to do all this hard work and be in bondage. But even in spite of all that, they keep multiplying and growing, don't they? So look what the next step is. It says in verse number 15, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, which the name of the one was Shifra, 
in the name of the other, Pua. And he said, when ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. So what do we see here in this story? Number one, God's people are multiplying greatly. Number two, the devil doesn't like it. Number three, he afflicts them with burdens, hard work, servitude, and makes their lives rigorous and difficult. And then number four, he instructs the Hebrews to murder their children. But you know what the devil has done to try to stop God's people from multiplying is he says, you know what, let's put them to work. And notably, he wants to put the women to work. Put the women to work. That'll stop them from multiplying. Because what was the devil's answer in Exodus 1? He said, put them to work and then kill the ones that are conceived. And that's exactly what the devil's agenda is today. He says, number one, send the women to work. And then they won't be able to reproduce because they're not going to be able to miss work. They're not going to be able to take care of the kids. So they're going to be so busy with their job, they're going to be forced to use birth control. And then not only that, but the ones that they would conceive, we will slay them through what? Birth control pills that do cause silent early abortions and also through abortion itself, surgical abortion itself. Now, the United States Department of Labor has these statistics for 2013 that women participating in the labor force in 2013 that are of a working age is 57.2% and men working is 69.7%. It's not even that different. I mean, think about it. It's only about what a 12% difference between the men working versus the women working. It didn't used to be that way, folks. It used to be that men went out to work and the women stayed home. That was the norm. That was the accepted uh, societal norm that men would go to work and provide and that the women would stay home, marry, bear children and guide the house. I think I read that in the Bible. First Timothy chapter five, verse 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. I will, God's will, I will therefore that women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. That's what the Bible says. But this story that we see playing out in Exodus chapter 1 is the devil's modus operandi in 2014 as well. Same thing. Put the women to work and then slay the unborn. That's the plan. You say, okay, Pastor Anderson, you've at least convinced me that the birth control pills are wrong because they are taking a life. I mean, how can you be against the morning after pill and not against normal birth control pills when the morning after pill is just a high dosed birth control pill. That's all it is. The morning after pill contains the same hormones at a higher dose that will just quickly change the lining of the uterus to make it a hostile environment for the child. That's why it works. But you say, well, Pastor Anderson, okay, I'm convinced that uh, you know, birth control pills are the wrong way to go. They're abortifacients. But what about other birth control methods? I mean, come on. Are you telling me that birth control is just wrong and that there's no acceptable birth control method? In a word, yes. But let's just go through the methods quickly. And I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to get into any detail or be graphic or anything. But there are a few different types of methods. Go to Genesis chapter 38, if you would. Genesis chapter 38. Because Genesis 38 is the only mention of birth control in the entire Bible. It says in verse 8, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest that he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he slew him also. God got angry and killed him. Not a very good advertisement for birth control right here in Genesis 38. It's not looking good. And, and especially when you realize this is the only mention 
Uh, Bernie, he said, oh, Pastor Anderson, you poor ignorant fool. Don't you realize that the reason why God was mad at Onan was the reason why he spilled it on the ground? Why? What was wrong with his reason? You say, well, it's because he did it for a selfish reason. Yeah, but everybody who uses birth control is doing it for a selfish reason. Yeah. Name for me a birth control motivation that's not selfish. Why do today's Christians seek to limit the size of their families by means of birth control? Not one reason can be given as to why a Christian would want to bypass the blessing of children that is not motivated by either selfishness or a lack of faith in God. The Bible clearly teaches that it is the Lord that opens the womb of a woman and causes her to conceive a child. Who are we to tamper with the will of God? For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. Shall I bring to the birth, and not cause to bring forth, saith the Lord? Shall I cause to bring forth? And shut the womb, saith thy God. You say, okay, well, what other methods are there? There's got to be an acceptable method out there of birth control. Well, these are the basic classifications of birth control methods. First of all, you have hormonal birth control. And that's going to include your, your IUDs that release hormones, these Mirena ring thing, and the patch, and the shot, and the mini pill, and the combination pill. All hormonal birth control methods, we'll put those in the same category, and those should be immediately ruled out of being manslaughter. Or if you do it intentionally on purpose, it would be murder. If you do it by accident, it's manslaughter, okay? Those are ruled out. Well, then another method that people would use is the Onan method, we'll, we'll call it. You know, spilling it on the ground. You know, the Bible isn't really saying anything positive about that method. Then another method that people would use is, is a barrier method, is what they'll call it. And to me, a barrier method is pretty much the same thing as Onan's method. You know, I'll put it in the same category, personally, okay? And then another method that's pretty popular amongst Catholics, and this is what the Catholics teach that you should be doing, is called natural family planning, or NFP. Now, natural family planning, you know, you're not really using birth control per se, because you're not using barriers, you're not using the pills or anything like that. I, I'm just going to say it right now. I'm against natural family planning. I don't believe in it. My children are approximately two years apart and we do not use any birth control. We use none. Zero. Zilch. Okay. The only birth control method we use is getting on our knees and praying for God to give us more children. That's our only birth control that we use. Okay. But we never use any. So how, and I'll explain to you a little later how our children are two years apart, and we do not use natural family planning. NFP, this is also sometimes known as the rhythm method. We do not use it. And I'm repeating this because people often mistakenly think, oh, Pastor Anderson, you know, believes in natural family planning. Or Pastor Anderson is, you know, believes in the rhythm. No, I don't. I've never taught that, never believed that. We don't use it. None of our children are spaced through natural family planning. Natural family planning is where you chart out a woman's cycle and they, they, they chart out her monthly cycle and sometimes they'll use computer software, smartphone app, different charts, maybe even take your temperature and, and chart all this data and enter it into a computer. And this software will tell you when you are the most fertile each month. So there's about five to seven days a month that are blacked out as, okay, this is the time when she's most likely to get pregnant. So if you abstain during these five to seven months, she's probably not going to get pregnant. That's called natural family planning or the rhythm method. Now, a lot of Catholics will use this, and this is what the Catholic Church promotes, and they'll say this. They'll say, well, you know, God could still make you get pregnant if he wanted to. So it's not really birth control. You know, so it's just kind of like, well, you know... It could still be, but, but here's, the, here's why I'm against natural family planning. Because of the fact that, 
first of all, there's another big blackout period each month, if you know what I mean. So now we have two major blackouts each month, number one, okay? But number two, the fact is that during the blackout period is actually the best time for a husband and his wife to hit the sack because that's actually when a woman is going to enjoy it the most. You know, I'm not trying, I'm keeping this G rated, but it's just a scientific fact that women actually desire intimacy the most during that period. Why? Because when their body is ovulating and when they are releasing that egg and able to become pregnant, they naturally desire that union with their husband. So it's, isn't it kind of foolish to black out the best part of the month for intimacy between husband and wife and say, well, okay, the best time for doing it, the best week, we're not gonna do it that week. That's not very good for your marriage, okay? Especially because now you have these two big blackout periods each month. So half the month is X'd off the calendar, okay? But not only that, look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter seven. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may use natural family planning. Is that what it says? It says, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. What is the purpose of God saying, hey, do not abstain from a physical relationship with your spouse. Do not defraud one the other. He said, because you don't want Satan to tempt you for your incontinency. And the blackout period of natural family planning is the time when the husband and wife would be the most open to temptation. So, and, and it, God's not even making any allowance for it here. He's not teaching us, that, hey, abstain every month in order not to have children. No, children are a blessing. They're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. We're supposed to be having lots of children according to the Bible. Psalm 127 says this, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. God says children are a blessing. We should want to have our quiver full of them. It's a, it's a joy and a blessing and a good thing to have children. So when you teach this and you say, hey, be fruitful, multiply, increase abundantly, exceedingly, have children, don't use birth control. You don't need to be Onan. You don't need to murder your own children. You don't need to sit there and abstain from a physical relationship from your spouse during the best parts of the month. No, the Bible is telling us to have children. People will say this. Well, if you do that, you're just going to get pregnant every nine months. And that's not healthy. That's what they'll say, won't they? If you, if you heard this opposition. Now, personally, I don't think that that's healthy for women to have children every nine or 10 months. And frankly, that's why God didn't design it that way. And that's why even though my wife and I use no birth control, we do not have children every nine or 10 months. You say, Pastor Anderson, how do you do it? How are you not having children every 11, 12 months, Pastor Anderson? What's the deal? What's your secret? Hosea chapter one, verse eight says this. Now, when she had weaned lo Ruhama, she conceived and bare a son. When did this woman conceive? When she weaned. Why? Because breastfeeding will stop you from getting pregnant. Simply breastfeeding your baby regularly and exclusively can help you prevent another pregnancy for six months. How does it work? Well, if you breastfeed exclusively, that means no formula or other baby foods, the hormones in your body will naturally change to prevent ovulation, the release of an egg. No egg, no pregnancy. This all happens naturally without a prescription or any medication. Breastfeeding is safe, simple, and convenient. There are no negative side effects. There's nothing to buy. There are a lot of great health and nutrition benefits for your baby and for you. Breastfeeding is incredibly effective as birth control. So effective that for every 100 women who breastfeed continuously for the first six months after birth, only one or two of them will get pregnant. It is 99% effective if you do it properly. If you breastfeed on demand, your child, that will prevent you from getting pregnant again until it is naturally safe to do so. Look, God designed it in his wisdom. 
Think about how smart God is. God designs it where a woman gives birth to a child and then breastfeeding that child keeps her from getting pregnant again until her body has a chance to recover. And then by the time the child is older and grown and, and you know, able to eat a lot of solids and breastfeeding less and less, then the woman's fertility will come back and then she'll be able to have the next child. And this is not a birth control method because we were, you know, we were going to breastfeed the kid anyway. It's just called doing it normal. It's called just having your kid and feeding it the way God planned. So this isn't natural family planning. That's why I want to make sure there's no confusion here. This is not a birth control method. This is not using birth control and yet having children that are spaced normally and naturally and healthily. But this is why it doesn't work for most people because if you put your kid on a four hour feeding schedule, not gonna work. You must feed the child on demand, meaning when it's hungry, feed it. And with a newborn, that's pretty much every hour. So when my wife has a little baby, she's feeding the baby constantly. She's nursing it constantly, okay? That's one of the rules, okay? Number two, the baby has to sleep in bed with you. Because if you don't have the baby in bed with you, then you can't feed it on demand throughout the night every hour. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, baby in bed with you. That's a bassinet next to the bed. No. See, and this is why it doesn't always work for people because they don't follow the protocol that's gonna work. They try to do a four hour feeding schedule. They're supplementing with bottles. They're, they're having the baby in a bassinet or a crib or something like that. No, the baby has to be in bed with you. Society wants you using birth control. I think Exodus 1 shows us why. Because the devil doesn't like it when God's people multiply. And while the Mormons are multiplying, and while the Muslims are multiplying, God's people are having 2.5 children, and it's a shame. We as God's people need to multiply abundantly, and churches would be filled with a new generation that's growing up and learning the word, precept upon precept, line upon line, and they're gonna grow up and be by the army for the Lord, but instead, people are refusing to have kids because they're serving the idols of this world and chasing after materialism, or they're buying into the ideology of the Satan worshiper, Margaret Sanger because they're being brainwashed by TV and school and everything else. And I'm here to tell you today that God's way is the best way, the natural way, the Christian way. And if you would get on God's program by faith and just step out in faith and say, hey, I'm gonna do it God's way, you know what, you'll find that God will provide and that God will give you a lot of joy and happiness in your life. And God's gonna bless you because the path to God's blessing is through the door of obedience. The people of God have been heavily influenced by the ungodly world system. And the key doctrines of the Bible presented here have all but fallen by the wayside. We have gone from condemning all methods of birth control to condoning and even promoting birth control pills, which are the most heinous form of birth control. Would to God this generation would stand up and fight for this key doctrine of God's word and cleanse our churches from the blood of our sons and daughters.
You know, the Bible's really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. A lot of people think they're pretty good, you know, and yeah, they're going to get to heaven because they're pretty good. But the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, that as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous, you're not righteous. And if it were our goodness that would get us into heaven, none of us would be going. Because the Bible even says in Revelation 21, 8, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and sorcerers and whoremongers and idolaters, and listen to this, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I've lied before. Everybody's lied before. So we've all sinned and we've done stuff worse than lying, let's face it. We all deserve hell. But the Bible says, but God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Jesus Christ, because he loves us, came to this earth. The Bible says he was God manifest in the flesh. God basically took on human form. He lived a sinless life. He did not commit any sin. And of course, they beat him and spit on him and, and nailed him to the cross. The Bible says that when he was on that cross, he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done, every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And then, of course, they took his body when he died. They took his body and buried it in the tomb. And his soul went down to hell for three days and three nights, Acts 2.31. Three days later, he rose again from the dead. He showed unto the disciples the holes in his hands. And the Bible's really clear that Jesus did die for everybody. It says that he died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. But there's something that we must do to be saved. The Bible says, it has that question in Acts 16, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that's it. He didn't say join a church and you'll be saved, get baptized and you'll be saved, live a good life and you'll be saved, repent of all your sins and you'll be saved. No, he said believe. And even the most famous verse in the whole Bible that's written on the bottom, I mean, the, the reference is written on the bottom of the cup at In-N-Out Burger. I mean, it's so famous. Everybody's heard of it, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And everlasting means everlasting. It means forever. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Bible says in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So if you believe on Jesus Christ, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You're going to live forever. You can't lose your salvation. It's eternal. It's everlasting. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever. And no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And if I went to hell, God lied because he promised that whoever believeth in him has everlasting life. And he said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's why there are a lot of examples of people in the Bible who did some really bad stuff, yet they made it to heaven. How? Because they were so good? No, it's because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Their sins are forgiven. Other people who may have lived a better life in the world's eyes, or maybe even really they lived a better life, they don't believe in Christ. They're going to have to go to hell to be punished for their sins. And let me just close on this one thought. One thing that I wanted to be sure and bring up today is that there was a question that was asked to Jesus by one of his disciples. And that question was this, are there few that be saved? That's a good question, right? I mean, are most people saved? Or is it few that are saved? Now, who here thinks that most people are going to heaven? Most people in this world are going to heaven. Yeah, guess what the answer was? He said, in Matthew 7, for example, he said, enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, because wide is the gate and broad is the way, that lead it to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And then he went on to say this. He said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, 
Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so you see, there are people out there. First of all, the majority of this world doesn't even claim to believe in Jesus. Thankfully, the majority of this classroom claims to believe in Jesus. Okay, But the majority of the world does not claim to believe in Jesus. But God warned that even amongst those who claim to believe in Jesus, even amongst those that call him Lord, many will be saying to him, what about all our, we did all these wonderful works. Why aren't we saved? He's going to say, depart from me. I never you. That's, why, that's because salvation is not by works. And if you're trusting your own works to save you, if you think you're going to heaven because you've been baptized, or if you think you, well, I think you have to live a good life. I think you have to keep the commandments to be saved. I think you have to go to church. I think you got to, you know, turn from your sins. You know, if you're trusting in your works, Jesus is going to say to you one day, depart from me. I never knew you. You have to have all your faith in what he did. You have to put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross when he died for you, he's buried and rose again. That's your ticket into heaven. If you're trusting all the things, oh, I'm going to heaven because I'm such a good Christian and I do all these wonderful things. He's going to say, depart from me. And notice what he said. Depart from me, I never knew you. Not I used to know you. Because once he knows you, remember I mentioned this earlier, it's everlasting, it's eternal. Once he knows you, you're saved forever. But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because if you go to hell, it's because he never knew you. Because once he knows you, he knows you. It's just like my children will always be my children. You know, when you're born again, when you're his child, you'll always be his child. You may be the black sheep of the family. You know, you may be uh, somebody who gets disciplined by God heavily on this earth. You can screw up your life down here, but you can't screw that up. You know, you're saved. It's a done deal. And so that's the main thing that I wanted to present to you about the end times. And we do have just a few minutes for uh, questions about either uh, salvation or about the end times.